Thank you, thank you, thank you, thank you all for coming, yay. We must relish our love for the doctor. We've been talking about him in many ways across this set of lectures. This one is obviously about masculinity, which I think is a really interesting thing to study in the modern world because it's a growing and changing thing, all right? So we're going to look across time. We're going to focus largely on new who and see how masculinity has been represented. And we think about cultural studies and media studies. It's not just, ooh, I'm a fan of this and, and um, I'm a geek, all right? It's about what do we take away from these shows? And we take away more than we think. TV has been very, very influential in a lot of modern history. Right? If you think about how the civil rights movement showed up in TV shows, we think about how feminism has shown up, and we talked about that last time. Right? So every time we see things, it starts making us rethink about the world around us. And likewise, the shows are reflecting where we are. So it's always the chicken and the egg. Who came first, the ideas, or did the ideas influence people, or did people influence the ideas? I think it's obviously hand in hand. So we're going to talk about masculinity across all these lovely gentlemen who've played the doctor before. What I thought was perfect for me was Day of the Doctor, their 50th anniversary special, started with a quote by Marcus Aurelius. Waste no more time arguing about what a good man should be. Be one, which is really very close to do or do not. <laughs> all right, there is no try. It's always the same kind of idea. Let's just go do these things. I think that's quite wonderful. So we will come with this quote in this episode celebrating the entire series. Um, and I'm going to talk about how I think that's reflected. Now, we also had to think about if we're talking about what men are, I prowled through the internet to discover what do women want in men? Because men are the thing that women want them to be because they generally want to be with women. All right. And um, this is in no particular order. I put intelligence first. It did show up on all the lists that I found. So thankfully, that's a good thing. Respect, humor showed up always within one, two, or three. Always that was a thing that women were looking for. And I think we'll see that obviously reflected. We were talking about Tom Baker a minute ago. Right? Empathy, I think, is a new one. I notice on some lists and not other ones. And that's really going to be something we see reflected in Doctor Who. Right? Didn't used to be vulnerability. Empathy wasn't something we thought men should have. And yet now we're going, well, that would make you completely human. So why shouldn't you have it? Right? So I think that's a big one. Being a good parent or a possible good parent, and likewise being a good son to your parents. And that's actually an old adage. If you marry a man, don't do it until you see how he treats his mother, because that's how he'll treat you. <laughs> so that's been an old wives' tale about what to look for in men. But now our generation is starting to look also in how do they parent? Will this person make a good father to the children that I might have? And we're going to see that reflected in Doctor Who. And then, of course, all of them mentioned good hygiene, which we all know is a code word for hot looking. <laughs> and I think that's true of most of our doctors. And then ambition and honesty is a pretty basic one. Right? And of course, if you flip that, that's really all the stuff men are looking for in women as well. <laughs> so it's just really what makes a quality human being. And I think that's really of interest to us. The other thing I would say is that that, as I said, is reflected in all of our guys. Right? Now, these are the archetypes of masculinity in general literature and stories, right? So we want adventurers, gentlemen, statesmen, warriors, lone wolves, and family men, which seem to sort of argue with each other right there. But we'll see how they play out in all of our different men. I would say all of them have these qualities. There you go, end of lecture. <laughs> but. I think the first three, and as I was picking through all of the doctors and what I had to say about them, the first three are reflected more largely in our original eight doctors, right? So we have this first set right here, as we know, right? So they show us adventurers, because they escaped with the TARDIS. They ran off into the world of time and space. They're all gentlemen, and they're all pretty much statesmen, as are these four, Peter Davison being my favorite. But they all get these, and also we very much get the, the um, clown out of Sylvester McCoy there down at the bottom. I would say of all the doctors, John Pertwee was the most elegant of all the gentlemen. He could rock a cape like nobody else. <laughs> so I think he gets points for that. But my favorite gentleman, Peter Davison. Man looks good in a cricket outfit. I just think he's a very charming man. And he played that charming character very much. Um, statesman, Tom Baker, actually was the Lord President of Gallifrey in an early episode of his. So I think that's kind of fun, right? So we have this represented in all these early guys. They do not show these tendencies nearly as much, so let's think about it. Those guys were popular in the 60s and 70s, 
right? So then the world changes a little bit, feminism steps in, women start looking for different things, and how do we deal with men who have more complex emotions than just, I'm the hero adventurer, right? So I'm gonna say that these three things show up more often in our last four gentlemen, and that's what we're gonna look at a little more deeply, also because they're the most known guys right now, right? Gee whiz, in Day of the Doctor, he named himself the Warrior Doctor. He literally says it out loud. So this is his definition because he is the person in that time war that had to make the big choice of destroying the world. Essentially, he's Truman deciding whether or not to drop the atomic bomb, but in this case, it's going to destroy not just Japan, but America too. And he has to decide to do that in order to make sure the bad guys don't win. And that's a huge job. We ask men to be warriors, and that means they're going to go out in the world. We ask them to kill for us. And that is a huge responsibility to put on someone. So I think it's really interesting that that's reflected in this later batch of doctors. Imagine we're dealing in a world where we've been at war for the last eight years, right? So we've been more involved in war than we had been in the 60s and 70s. Um, I have to say, it was impressive we got John Hurt. I just had to flip over here to Derek Jacoby for a minute. Because really, this shows us the power of the new who. These are huge names to do a television program. right? So I just love that. If you haven't seen him as a master, you must, because he's marvelous. And if you haven't seen I, Claudius, you must, because he's marvelous. <laughs> All right, but back to Warriors. So of course, before we knew John Hurt existed, we knew Eccleson as the warrior doctor, right? And he was really someone who was left with the, the trauma of having made that decision, right? We didn't know that a different version of him had made it. So he defined himself as well as a warrior. And then we have our beloved David, at least my beloved David, <laughs> who is, I would say, a representation of both the warrior and the lone wolf. But I'm going to add, he's got post-traumatic stress disorder, much more than Eccleston reveals it. He's really talking about how bad he feels about what happened. And I think that's what endeared him to so many people, his ability to share his emotions, which I think is one of the definitions, we go back to empathy, that defines a modern man. And I think that's why he captured so many people as quite a favorite doctor in this period. Just a little sidebar on post-traumatic stress disorder. That is something our society is talking much more about than we ever did before. And it's evidenced in this BBC version of Robin Hood, which ran a few seasons ago. I highly recommend. If you like Doctor Who, you will love this Robin Hood. He comes back from the Crusades with post-traumatic stress disorder. Never have you seen a Robin Hood who realizes he was sent off to kill people and he's unhappy about having made that choice. And he's a really interesting, very good character. I like this series very much. Um, this is the cast, Jonas Armstrong. And you probably recognize Richard Armitage from what? The Hobbit, yes indeed. He's the star of the Hobbit movies. So this is pre-Hobbit, right? He's Guy of Gisborne. But in this idea that the modern day, we're all talking about post-traumatic stress disorder and how that's affected the men in our world. So I think we see that obviously in Doctor Who. And look, even Matt, who really is the comic fool for a long time, he's a warrior in his last episode in Trenzalore. It's about being a warrior. So this, this is evident in all four of our regular guys, our recent guys. And of course, in the day of the doctor, we literally see them perform as warriors in front of everyone. Now, thinking about their companions, you can't get a better companion than Jack Harkness. He is obviously a warrior. He's a World War II soldier, for heaven's sakes. But he's going to be really interesting in the definition of manhood because he's gorgeous, right? And we're all thinking about that. We're all going, okay, he's like the hottest companion ever. So good hygiene is definitely evidence in this character, right? Wink, wink, nudge, nudge. So he's about the manliest guy that the doctor meets, but he's the newest version of manhood because what do we know about Jack? He's gay. To a modern audience, that's our definition. Now, of course, they actually say he's, he's omnisexual. He has sex with anything, aliens, human, women, men, anything. Um, so he's a very, very modern reflection of a man. But I think this is a huge step. And of course, we know, or you may know, if you don't know, they spun Jack off into his own show, Torchwood, um, which I found a wonderful show. Um, I've got a chapter in a book on Torchwood right here. Um, and he also shows us a man who can deal with a powerful woman. Right? And that's Gwen in this series is his equal in terms of carry the gun, take out down the bad guys, all of that stuff. There's no I'm better than you argument. They're very equal and they're both capable of that, which makes for a really, really interesting series. 
But so Jack, I think, gives us a few things. He's a warrior, but then he's this new person that we're going to accept in our society, which wouldn't have happened in the 60s or 70s. So Jack's a pretty important guy. Hey, in our most recent male companion, we have Danny Pink, also a warrior, also affected by post-traumatic stress disorder from our most recent war. Right? So he's living with that on a daily basis while he tries to take care of Clara and see where he can go in his life. So I think he's a really cool character. Now, this leads me to the family men, which I think is the most defining characteristic. And I almost would say in the new who, but I'm going to show you how it affected the old who as well. But they're in this period all referencing that. Now we go back to the old who because it started with a father a grandfather figure, right? So we were given a family man to begin with to want to follow through time. His granddaughter Susan is who is his first companion. So we had him. Then we didn't really talk about the doctor's family for a long time until, any guesses? The doctor's daughter. Finally, we got to a daughter. Very interesting. Now, we know she's a clone thing and blah, blah. blah. So it's not really like he was married and had a kid yet. Um, but we have the doctor's daughter, who's played by the actress Georgia Moffat. And this is the most interesting, complex bit of Doctor Who fandom family, as you can imagine, because Georgia Moffat is the daughter of Peter Malcolm Gordon Moffat, who goes by the name of Peter Davison as an actor, which means the doctor is his own father-in-law. <laughs> because the two married a few years ago and have their own child. So Peter Davison is the father-in-law to, father to David Tennant. So that's just hilarious. Inside, how could that possibly happen, right? So now, when I think about Mickey Smith, and I want to think about masculinity, he suits a lot of little places, a lot of these definitions. You would think we can talk about him as a warrior, because in fact he did become one. He's probably the man who grew the most in his knowledge and his time with the doctor. He went from the little puppy dog boyfriend of Rose who was done and she wasn't liking him anymore, and then he found his way to being a hero in his own life. And so much so that of course, as we know, he ended up marrying Martha who is really a very, very powerful female character, I believe, right? So the trick about Mickey when I think about the idea of being a warrior is, let me see if I did this right, no, backwards. Hmm. All right, when he made the choice to stay in the alternative universe, right? He didn't choose that just because it meant that he was going to continue to fight bad aliens, which is the warrior part of him. He chose to stay there because in the real world, his grandmother, who he lived with, was already dead. In the alternative universe, she was still alive. And so he chose to stay there so that he could continue to know his grandmother. That is a family man. That is a man making a choice about what's useful and beneficial to his family above and beyond any of the other things that masculinity would require. I think that's adorable. It's not even staying with his grandfather to learn manhood from him. It's staying with his grandmother who needed somebody to take care of her and who he still needed in his life for that influence that she had. And I think that's a really, really beautiful part of Mickey and where he grew. So yes, and of course, as I said, in the end, we see in the end of David's that he married Martha. So again, turned himself into a family man by marrying someone who had a similar adventure as he did and understood the world. How are you going you know, to marry somebody who hasn't gone on the same adventures? It's why Ron and Hermione get together, all right? <laughs> they have this shared history. No one else is going to understand what they've been through. So the same is true of the two of these. And I must say, from a production standpoint, um, this caused some controversy, and I mentioned this a few speeches ago. We talked about race in Doctor Who. Many people wrote in and they were angry that the answer to their story seemed to be that the, the English people of African descent ought to have married each other and didn't end up married somebody else. And it turned out that that was not Russell Davies' original plan. This particular book I find charming for people who are interested in writing television. It is email between Russell Davies and a news reporter for the entire last two seasons of David Tennant's time on the show, and he would talk about his ideas for different episodes. So you watch the, the email go from, I want to do an episode where water is dangerous, 
and then you have Waters of Mars. And you've invented Adelaide and all these interesting characters. And you watch the growth of those stories through him sending emails at 2 in the morning going, I think this is what I'm going to do. And one of those interesting emails for me was about the fact that he put them together and then he got some mail from people saying, I can't believe you did that. That seems very silly of you. You were doing all these exciting new things and then you did this very traditional thing. Well, it turned out the actors, of course, hadn't been on the show in a couple of years when David was leaving. And so when they went to schedule them for their separate moments of saying goodbye to their doctor, the only day both of these actors were available was this day for a half a day from 8 to noon. That's all he had to work with them. And you're not going to shoot two different scenes in that time frame. So for production purposes, Davies had to put them together. And he thought, well, come on. If you're going to put them together, put them together. That's something fun. So I think it's very interesting. We have to pay attention to production needs when somebody's writing something. But I say that this is a perfect wrap up for Mickey because it makes him choose family in the end. That is what defines him. And I think that's pretty cool. Now, you all saw the preview of who's next. Mm -hmm. Oh, my goodness gracious. How can we not talk about Rory when we talk about family men? All right, Rory being, before Danny, the most recent male to travel with the doctor, think about Rory. We meet him, what's his profession? He's a nurse, he's not a doctor, he's a nurse. That is gender traditionally a female job, although in the modern world more men are wanted in nursing because why? Strength, we've become an obese society, you need heavy people to lift Seriously, they want men to be nurses because we need more homes. Where right? think about it, you're lifting a five, or excuse me, a 300-pound person out of a hospital bed. I ain't doing that. <laughs> so it's going to be interesting to watch that profession change over. In fact, I have a brother-in-law, excuse me, a cousin-in-law, who was going to be a psychiatrist, and he got through half the program, and he realized he had enough credits and whatnot to become a nurse, and he went, I think I'm done. I'm good with this. So he's a nurse, and he's. Well, and, then they went into nursing. and they have it, and that's probably part of it. But largely, when I, I talked to a friend who is a nurse, and she said that's the hospitals are going for them because they need strength. The, the coming back warriors, that's a really interesting story because that's getting a lot more people who are going to be art therapists and music therapists. Kids are going into those jobs knowing that we're going to have a lot of PTSD in the population in the next 10 years, and those jobs are going to explode. So we have Rory, who's a nurse. That's a definite choice, right? Macho is not nurse until maybe 20 years from now. <laughs> and yet, when Amy keeps getting the chance to choose between men, ooh, the doctor, or Rory, she continually chooses Rory, who to her is the manliest man because he's dedicated to her and their family. In fact, as we know, He's so dedicated to her, he spends 2,000 years guarding the Pandorica to keep her safe. 2,000 years waiting to make sure nobody can harm her. You can't get better than that. And that makes him a warrior as well. But a warrior for the purpose of protecting a member of his family. That's how deeply a family man he is. And I think that's so cool. Of course, along the way, he gets to be a full family man because he and Amy have a baby. All right, and I think it's very important. There's a photograph of him holding his child. It's not just her always holding the baby and taking care of it. This is a shared parenting, which is part of the modern generation. I go back. Y'all are probably lucky. Your dads were probably more involved. But if you get back to my generation's dads, they're the folks who went to work, came home, had dinner, watched TV, and never talked to their kids. And that was what men did, right? And over the course of the last couple of generations, parenting has become a, a co-job. And you can see a dad just as easily taking his kid to the doctor or going to a school function and helping out. It's become a definition of men in this new generation to be family caretakers, to be involved to go to the soccer games, even if they're not coaching, right? And to go to the birthday party at school when you have to hand out little cupcakes with candles in them. That's become a new definition, right? Y'all are probably more used to that, but it's not something that happened in the past. So Rory is a reflection of modern day fathers and what women are looking for in a modern man if they're going to spend the rest of their life. You want somebody else who's going to help you clean the toilets, right? When you get married, it's not just you making dinner every night. It's a shared job. It didn't used to be, 
right? I had a friend who'd go to work, her husband got home an hour before she did. He would sit on the couch and wait for her to get home and start making dinner, because dinner was her job. Yeah, yeah, so things have switched around, things, and the show is reflective of that. I think that's really beautiful. And of course we know who the baby grew up to be. River Song, who allows us a family of pawns, even though they were, they were stripped of the chance to raise her. We now have the pond family as part of the doctor's story. And again, Rory overlooking all of that. And he had to deal with his feelings of losing his chance to raise his child, right? That was something that harmed him more than all the danger. And how many times did Rory die? Really now, all those deaths didn't bother him near as much as being denied the chance to raise his own child. So I think that defines him much more deeply as a family man above all other things. Hey, and by the way, his daughter married the doctor. So now they're all, he is the father-in-law to the doctor. Can't get more family than that. <laughs> so I think that's a beautiful definition for Rory all the way through. Now, not just pay attention to all the modern day guys, though, like I said, well, first we have to do James Corden because he's adorable. <laughs> all right, one of my favorite episodes to do with family and fatherhood, right, is the episode where James Corden guest starred as Craig Owens, and his job was to take care of his baby, and he was very bad at it. How many people have seen this episode? All right, how cute is Stormageddon? All right, poor James. And of course, we know James Corden from Into the Woods right now in his own TV show, but what's great about this episode is what saves his life. Does being a warrior save his life? Does being super intelligent save his life? When the Cybermen show up and turn him into a Cyberman, which we have never seen anyone undo. Once the Cybermen get you, you are done. And the poor doctor has to do those emotion inhibitor things and suddenly you feel emotions and you blow up. It's the only way to kill you once you're a Cyberman. Except for him. He breaks the bonds of cyber because he hears his baby cry. And his need to go save his child is stronger than the pull the Cybermen have on him in this metal casket that they're creating around him. If that's not a dad, I don't know what is. That's not a man who defines himself by his fatherhood. I do not know what is. So I think that's a really interesting, again, turn in the modern who, right? This is how Stephen Moffat is defining masculinity. It's men who love their families. That's the highest calling that a man can be brought to. Ah, now we go back to Danny Pink, right? Danny, we don't get a chance to see, do the whole dad thing, but we see a few things. First of all, what's his job when he's not being a soldier? He's a teacher, right? So we define, again, teacher is a gender, gendered kind of job. We generally see women in the education field, especially when it's in middle school, elementary school, a few more guys in high school, but largely we see that as a female job because it's about nurturing a younger generation of people. So as a teacher, we see him protective of the children in his care. He is their pseudo father when they are at school with him. And I think that's really important. That's how Danny is defined for us. We see him first as this, and then we hear about the warrior, oh yeah, he was a soldier. So his first definition is this, right? And then what happens, sad, God forbid, you did realize there would be spoilers, right? I assume people have seen these episodes. So, right, God forbid, he's turned into a Cyberman too. Oh, right? And this is just so awful, so awful. But he is a warrior, and he's able to do a thing that will save the family around him, the people of Earth, right? By, you know, beating the Cybermen, by getting all these other Cybermen to follow him up. So we lo he loses Clara, which is terrible. But being the show, he gets that second chance to come back from the afterlife, and he doesn't take it, because there's only one chance to come back, and instead he gives it to the little Afghan boy that he killed by accident when he was at war. So he gives up his happiness and his chance, essentially at a resurrection, to give it to the child whose chance he took away. And he sends that child back into the world so he can start again. Again, if that isn't the pseudo-father to that child, then I don't know who is. 
I think that's a really, really powerful part of his storyline. He makes that choice. So the warrior goes back and remembers the harm that he did. And we didn't used to focus on that. In war movies, it was rah, rah, you killed a few more Japanese. Yay for you, right? That's a good thing. And now we're beginning to look at that as, no, 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 no. We don't want that to be the way we solve our problems. That doesn't make you a man. A gun doesn't make you a man. A brain does. The intelligence to get through problems in another way, right? And so Danny's the perfect, perfect example of that, if you ask me. Now, I'm going to go back in history to one character I don't think we give enough attention to, and that's Lethbridge Stewart, who arrives in the John Pertwee era as a, you know, a, a military dude. So he's a warrior from that period. And that's largely what we see him do for a long time. Again, we're in the 70s now, so we're not thinking about dads as an important role for men. But as we go through time and the show stays on the air, guess what? He grows older, you know, because time flies and actors are actual humans. And he appears on the Sarah Jane adventures here as Lethbridge Stewart, so he still exists in her time period. He's a grandfatherly type, and he's gonna help her with some adventures. Now, because he's a real human being, he passed away. By the time we got to Capaldi's episodes, and now here I'm in Death in Heaven, he has passed away. And so this is a portrait, and we have to be reminded of his existence as a character, in case you've never seen the show before because we're going to move to the ending place in this episode where he does the most fatherly, heroic thing, right? We learn that he has a daughter. So in the modern Who, the new military person is Kate Lethbridge-Stewart, his daughter. So she's inherited her father's job, if you will, but she's a science officer more than a military officer with UNIT, which is the group that takes care of all that. So we meet Kate, and when we get to death in heaven, the problem is all the corpses have been turned into Cybermen. And they're all rising out of the cemetery. And at a certain point, we lose Kate. You know, they toss her out of an airplane. <laughs> so we know she's dead, right? Because she hit the ground, splat, she's dead. Except, among all the corpses, we've been reminded is her father, who has been turned into a Cyberman. And when we go to that point in the episode, we find out that she's still walking around the cemetery. She hasn't been harmed because she never splat. He caught her and brought her to the ground safely. He protected his child all the way to the end. And then he went up to heaven with Danny, and you know, when Danny pulled all the Cybermen out, and it's the doctor who never salutes because he doesn't like the military, but for this act, the act of saving his child, he's going to salute. And I think that speaks to what the doctor thinks about what makes a man a man, right? And again, it's all tied into being part of a family. So I think that's a beautiful, I like Lethbridge Stewart. He's a good, and Kate, is a good, I was so worried when they pushed her out of the plane. Like, oh no, you didn't kill her. She's the coolest chick you've invented. And they didn't. So that was a very lovely tie-up, I must say. So that leaves me with wondering, of all the doctors, who is the manliest man? Any choices? Who fits the definition best? Yes, please. I kind of feel like the first doctor. Ah, be see him as a grandfather in like, the first episode, so he took the father in the role when he wanted to be mentored to his daughter. Oh. That's very good. That's true. I like that. You know, there's not like a one answer fits all. <laughs> But I think it's an interesting thing to ponder if we're critically thinking about our media and what messages is our media sending us. Who do we bond with? Who do we think's the best? I'll tell you. None of them. Why can't any of them be the manliest man? Hmm? Well, that's true. They are all one man. <laughs> that's good. No, I didn't go there. I went here. They aren't men. They aren't human. They're time lords. None of them can be the manliest man. All right, they're all time lords. However, I'm very interested in the actual manly men who appeared on the show. So from that group, who do we think defines masculinity in the modern world best? Ooh, why? He does it all. Right? He's a family man, but he's also a warrior and a protector. And he's a good dad. 
to both the baby and to the grown-up river, who he didn't get a chance to know. Imagine, you know, think about that's like an adoption story, where you meet your child when they're a grown-up. And how do you make a relationship with someone that you didn't share any time with? You've got to start from scratch, and that's exactly what he has to do with River Song. It's a very modern story. In the days before, when you never opened adoption paperwork, and you couldn't know that. So I think that Rory is a very, very modern guy. And a very manly man. He was a good pirate, too. <laughs> when he had to be. Who else? He's a very good husband. That's true, because he, he allows his wife to do what she chooses to do. He doesn't make her change her choices in life just to suit him, because he's not very comfortable when she goes off and does all that adventuring. It's a little scary for him at the beginning, right? And so I think that's true. I like that. He's a, and a husband, that's a good definition of a good man. Anybody else? I didn't pick, because I... I'm not going to pick for you. You've got to pick for yourself. These are the messages that we're being sent by this piece of popular culture. So how we're relating to those messages is the question. What I did do was look into who the show named as the most manly man. And they did in the day of the doctor. They made a choice. They mentioned the man that all men should live up to. Anybody remember who it was? the very end of Day of the Doctor. And it's John Hurt talking, because he's made that choice, right, in the end, and it makes the cool choice to not blow everybody up, which I thought was brilliant writing. Who knew you could do that? Literally rewrote the last 10 years of the series with that one choice, right? Yeah. Who did he pick as the manliest man ever to appear on Doctor Who? <laughs> A woman! A modern woman is the equal to any man. That's a modern man talking. That's a modern man thinking about people as complete and total equals. And to me, that was so cool when I stumbled on that. <laughs> it didn't even occur to me. And Clara's not necessarily my favorite character, but in this particular episode, she helped a decision be made that saved the world. She's the one who told me didn't have to drop the bomb. That's a huge manly choice. She influenced the lives of millions by standing up and saying that. So I think that was hilarious and wonderful. Which brings us back to that first quote. Waste no more time arguing about what a good man should be. Be one. Right now, today. Which means being a good family man. There you have it. Thank you so much for coming. Yay.